And so the CIA said either it was a bomb that went off accidentally, a reactor that went crazy, or a waste dump accident. And, uh, you know, after the Soviet Union broke apart, the files became declassified. And we know now that it was a waste dump accident. Uh, this was the mother of all nuclear accidents uh, before Chernobyl. Uh, about 20,000 curies of radiation were lofted into the atmosphere as a consequence. Um, even today, uh, when railroads go past that area, the conductors would uh, put the shade down, and you can't see what's outside. Uh, whole villages had to be evacuated. If you look at the census charts, all of a sudden certain villages would disappear uh, off the census chart in that area. So we know it was a big one. Uh, we know that quite a bit of radiation uh, went into the atmosphere. And uh, Roy Medvedev, a Russian dissident, actually wrote a book. Do we have any idea how many people were actually killed, evacuated, and never to be used again? In our Probably lives? tens of thousands were evacuated out of that area and were contaminated. How many wow. died, we, we don't know. I imagine now that the files are being declassified in Russia that uh, probably we can get more detailed uh, estimates of how many people died as a consequence of the, uh, the Christian uh, accident. Certainly we would want those ki that kind of information, wouldn't we? That's right. And by the way, um, England, about the same time, sustained its first big nuclear accident, which was totally hushed up in England. Uh, this was the wind scale, uh, pile number one in the 1950s. Uh, it was actually very much like the Chernobyl accident. It was carbon moderated. Uh, the carbon caught on fire, and you had a uranium carbon fire in the center of a nuclear power plant wow. in uh, Windscale, England. Uh, they'd never seen this before. Uh, a reactor actually in flames. Uh, the workers shot hose water, uh, hose water directly into the core of a nuclear power plant. This is unbelievable. But to read the files to believe it. How could I die? <laughs> a huge explosion took place. Gigantic amounts of gas have lost it in the air. I'm sure. And the Queen scientists tracked that radioactive cloud sailing over the English Channel. I... And they classified the whole thing. Only the Queen of England. She was the only civilian to be aware of this accident. Professor, uh, rest for a moment. We're at the top of the hour. Just totally blown away would be the way I would describe this last hour. Uh, some of it I had heard a little bit about, but almost everything we had this last this is incredible stuff. Stuff I've never heard. I'm sure many of you have never heard. And I guess something you want to take, make note of, because of course it's all absolutely true. And then let that go toward uh, shaping your feeling about things nuclear, I guess, and nuclear power. And I'm going to ask because about uh, some sensitive stuff. I think we already haven't covered that in a moment. The real beauty of talk radio, uh, the real core of talk radio is is the fact that a lot of times you'll do a talk show tonight as a perfect example and have uh, all sorts of things uh, lined up to talk about and then because you get off on a certain tangent that just happens in an unrehearsed way, boy, down a road you go that you weren't even ready for. I love it. Uh, here once again is Professor Kaku. Uh, Professor, I've interviewed you now many times, and I've come to uh, a divine conclusion, it's not very hard, that you are not, let's see, how can I best put this? Um, you might even be an anti-nuclear activist at, at heart. Is that is that fair? Or I mean, you had a chance to build the bomb, get in on building new and better and bigger bombs, and I know you turned it down. And you didn't go into that side of the work where you so easily could have. And I have a very strong sense that you're pretty anti-nuclear. Is that fair? Well, let me explain. Um, okay. Edward Teller, who recently passed away, was the uh, primary guiding influence when I was in high school and college. And I got to know the family quite well. And I got to know his politics and his thinking quite well. And as you mentioned, uh, he even offered me a position to design hydrogen warheads. Yes. Uh, and his position was that nuclear power is potentially unstable. It does not belong on the surface of the Earth. It belongs underground. 
So he thought that because nuclear power plants were un so unstable, because you could have supercriticality, meltdowns, right. bubbles, and three mile islands, right. they should be placed underground. So if there was an explosion, you'd simply put a manhole cover on it and walk away from it. Well, out of curiosity, Professor, why don't we do that? Well, actually, believe it or not, uh, Con Edison here in New York City, uh, I'm in Manhattan right now, wanted to build a nuclear power plant in Queens, right opposite the United Nations, in the heart of New York City. <laughs> and when the old Atomic Energy Commission said, over our dead body, will you build a nuclear power plant uh -huh. in, in uh, the center of New York City, Con Edison reapplied, saying, we'll put it underground. Uh, we'll have an underground nuclear power plant in the center of New York City, it was to be called the Ravenswood Nuclear Power Plant, right opposite the United Nations. So all the delegates from around the world would throw open the blinds and see the gigantic cooling towers of a commercial nuclear power plant op opposite the United Nations. Uh. <laughs> now, the, the point I raised is that even Teller, who, of course, unleashed the power of the hydrogen bomb, yes. who was certainly aware of the potential of, of nuclear energy, realized that, hey, you know, this is potentially unstable. Yeah. And an accident could really ruin commercial nuclear energy mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what he, his position was that he was pro-nuclear but that the only thing which could kill commercial nuclear power would be a horrible accident and that's why he thought of them putting, putting them underground mm -hmm. however as you can suspect the cost would be enormous you would have to excavate the entire nuclear facility and just place it underground it'd be prohibitively expensive but for me, it really impressed upon me the fact that even though we physicists uncork the genie and release the genie out of the bottle, sometimes this genie is unstable. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, we're too overconfident. Uh, we think we know the technology, and then boom, it spirals out of control. And uh, that, that really is a humbling experience, uh, realizing that this, this technology is unfinished. It's an unfinished technology. The question is whether we should finish it or not. Uh, it could be very expensive to finish this technology. We still don't know what to do with nuclear waste. Uh, Yucca Mountain in, uh, in your neck of the woods, where we have nuclear waste uh, to be stored uh, near Las Vegas. No, no woods here, but it's in my neck, all right. Right. Uh, that's a big problem. What are we going to do with all this nuclear waste? Oh, right. and I, I'm, you know, I mean, is that a yes? Uh, I would say that I'm critical of nuclear energy. Yes, okay, fair enough. Um, you, um, I believe, are of uh, Oriental ancestry, are you not? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Japanese, perhaps? That's right. Uh, Makaku sounds Japanese. Does what happened, Professor, in Japan, what the United States did at the end of the war in Japan, does that in any way, do you, do you think that your position on nuclear power is shaped by what happened in Japan? I don't think so, in the sense that I went the other way. Um, I thought that any technology that was that powerful, any technology that could flatten the city within a microsecond, yes. uh, should have enormous uh, benefits for the rest of the world.